Hello and welcome to another episode of Fully Charged News. Coming up, how many government vehicles can President Biden really, really make electric? How big can a solar farm be in Siberia? Will Apple make an electric car? Ever! Denmark are building renewable energy islands. Toyota are finally launching electric cars outside China. <laughs> and I attended a conference in Africa. But first, just a quick reminder of our amazing competition to win electric cars for a year, the great EV giveaway. If you subscribe to Fully Charged and pop over to our page at fullycharged.show forward slash EV dash giveaway, you can enter the competition. And unlike in the past where our prizes have only been available in the British Isles, it's now global, baby. And there's loads of brilliant intermediary prizes in our drive to get one million subscribers. So do subscribe and do go over and check the page. Fullycharged.show forward slash the thing. It's, there's the link. It's all below here. Now, back to the news. Now, I recently mentioned a story that made headlines about President Biden's executive order to have all the vehicles in the federal fleet electric vehicles in the United States, just so that you're, not, you're clear. Uh, of course, it's not quite that simple, but uh, I still say it's a very laudable aim. But of course, it's a huge undertaking. The total figure reported includes the United States Postal Service. Now, Numerous viewers from the United States pointed out to me, very rightly, that the USPS isn't in fact a government body, it's an independent establishment, and as such, the President has no power to make them do his bidding. So, the federal government runs 645,047 vehicles, they counted them, and 34% of them, 225,668, are, uh, but the, are used and belong to the USPS, the United States Postal Service. So that means President Biden only has the power to change 419,379 vehicles from fossil burners to electric. I mean, it's hardly worth a bother. Why even bother? Just, just carry on using diesel and petrol. I'm joking. That's nearly half a million vehicles. That is a massive, massive change. And for all we know, the USPS may see the economic savings of running electric delivery vans and vehicles and do it anyway. So that's cleared that up. Next story. There's no point having solar panels in the British Isles because it's simply not enough. Now, if I had a solar panel every time I heard that, I'd be able to open a solar farm in Siberia. What the what? Yes, a new solar power plant is starting to work in the south of Omsk region in western Siberia. The 30 megawatt SPP was built by the Hevel Energy Group, Russia's leading company in the solar industry. In Russia, in Siberia. These pictures are from the Kemal and Kosh Agash districts of the Altai Republic, and they are providing over 30% of the region's electricity needs in Siberia. So yes, solar panels work in far northern regions. And here's the thing to remember. In the winter, yes, fair enough, they produce diddly squit as it's dark nearly all night and all day. But in the summer, they produce a metric dung ton because it's sunny for around 20 hours a day. And these solar panels will be producing vast amounts of power. Next story, I hate Apple car stories. It's a bit like I hated Dyson car stories because they, I mean, look what happened to that. All the oh, Dyson making an electric car. Nothing. Anyway, this one keeps raising its little head. Hello, I'm an Apple car story. A couple of weeks ago, there were rumours that Apple was working with Hyundai. Now, a South Korean newspaper, Dong A Ilbo, reported talk of a $3.6 billion joint investment into a venture that clearly was meant to involve Apple and Kia. And it suggested that Apple vehicles could be built at the Kia plant in the US state of Georgia from 2024. Since then, since that was announced, everyone has denied everything and it's all a load of waffle. Regardless of this speculation, I think we can accept that after many decades of total stagnation and a massive lack of research and development into new technologies by the traditional auto industry, things are being shaken up good and proper. Some 
someone other than the Chinese are going to start building new electric cars without the dead weight of combustion engine factories around their necks. So, OK, it, I, I might start half believing that eventually in the next five years, Apple might be involved in some way in making an electric car. And while I'm speculating, there's just been a rash of stories about a new $25,000 Tesla compact or hatchback small car. The news was revealed by the head of Tesla's China division and has been backed up by Mr. Musk himself. And clearly this car will be made in China first. All sorts of release dates are being thrown around, but the people I tend to trust are saying somewhere around 2023 or 24 as being the likely time frame for a reasonably priced, smaller hatchback Tesla. Nice. Next story. I love slightly mad projects like this, although it makes a lot of sense and the Danes are the feet on the ground sort of people. They're not madcap. They are planning on building a 120,000 square meter island in the North Sea off the coast of Jutland. This island will have numerous roles. It will have a harbour with storm protection for all the service ships that tour the massive offshore wind farms. And they are massive and huge and there's millions of them. It will have systems to utilise the colossal amounts of electricity coming from hundreds of thousands of massive wind turbines, storing it either as compressed air, hydrogen or conventional batteries so it can uh, supply a constant power to over 3 million households in the surrounding countries. And it's quite nice to think that the British Isles is one of those surrounding countries, so we may benefit from the Danish energy island. Meanwhile, in South Korea, there are recent reports of the launch of a $43 billion project to build the world's biggest offshore wind farm. This is a real monster, producing 8.2 gigawatts, which is the equivalent of six nuclear reactors, according to Electrek. Now, I don't always want to harp on about the costs of nuclear, but I do think it's worth mentioning that building Hinkley Point C is currently costing around $31 billion, and it can only produce 3.2 gigawatts. 3.2, not quite as many. And one last thing on this, where is the world's largest offshore wind farm today? It's Hornsey 1 in the North Sea, between the British Isles and the Netherlands. It produces 1.1 gigawatts. That is quite big. And yes, the nuclear power station can run 24-7, we know that. But when they close it down for maintenance, it closes for many, many months, sometimes years. Just so that we know. We put it all in, we put it all in there. Zero carbon, absolutely, absolutely no problem with that. Next story, Toyota, who, let's face it, have been a bit laggardly when it comes to battery electric vehicles as in they haven't made any except in China. Well, now they've launched not one, but two new 100% electric vehicles in the US of A. But they are as reluctant as ever, citing what I think are very, very questionable statistics, suggesting a plug-in hybrid. A plug-in hybrid Toyota has the same environmental impact as a pure electric if they have to put this little amend amendment in, if you calculate the average USA generation mix which is getting cleaner because they're closing down coal plants as fast as anything. Uh, you know, they're suggesting that electricity in the US is still generated by coal, which it is, but that number is dropping every day. And in other countries where they could sell this car, it would be massively cleaner. Just why are two, they just cannot bear the fact that they might possibly have put the money on the wrong horse in this race. They put it all into hydrogen and it's just when is it going to happen? I'm happy. I'm happier that they make hydrogen cars than diesel or petrol ones. It's much better. But we're just not seeing it happen. And everywhere around the world, it's battery electric. That is winning. It may change. But at the moment, that is winning by a massive, embarrassing, humiliating, brutal, bullying margin. Hydrogen is not working for small passenger vehicles. When will people work it out? Anyway, last story. A couple of days ago, I attended a conference in Africa. OK, I was sitting right where I am now, but I still attended and it was coming from Africa. God, I was very grateful for the invitation because it was absolutely fascinating. This Africa Day event was organised by a company called Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. Now, we've worked with Benchmark in the past and they've had speakers at our fully charged live events. They are such a useful source of genuine research and intelligence as their business is understanding what is really happening in the world of minerals extraction, i.e. mining for stuff. 
digging it up, turning it into something else. They don't pontificate about various minerals to make a cheap political point. They look at data and shifts in the market, and they give advice to companies all over the world about the availability and cost of vitally important materials across the industrial sector. And what became apparent very quickly is Africa is going to be a central supplier of materials for the electric vehicle market. Now, of course, we know this can go one of two ways. The traditional way, as we've seen over the past 120 years with the oil industry in particular, goes like this. You go to a developing country, you bribe a handful of key political figures. If they won't accept the bribes, you fund the opposition to take over in a violent military coup and then make a land grab. You start extracting oil, employ a very small handful of local people, create massive pollution with no checks, make huge piles of money. And then when the oil runs out, which it always, always, always does, you just leave the hideous mess you've made and move on to make profits somewhere else. So it was really encouraging to see actual Africans who live in Africa who are working towards energizing Africa for its own future. Even Glencore, a global mining oil and gas company headquartered in Switzerland, made a very positive and encouraging pitch at the conference. And in case you don't know, Glencore are one of the biggest mining companies on earth. In 2019, their total revenue was 215.1 billion dollars. Now to put that into a context most of us would understand, Tesla's annual revenue in 2020 was 10.7 billion. I mean that's a lot but it's not as much as 250 billion. But the revelations about working conditions in artisanal mines in the Democratic Republic of Congo in recent years have not been good publicity for anyone, even though this practice is nothing to do with Glencore. I mean, they run massive mines with massive machines that dig up billions of tons of material every year. And this year, they estimate they will produce 25,000 tons of cobalt. But the fact that any children anywhere are forced to work in dangerous conditions is deeply wrong. Of course, the fossil lobby have managed to turn this tragedy into a battery bashing exercise, popular with some pro-fossil extremists. And it's doubly ironic as the fossil fuel industry itself is a major consumer of cobalt. It is used to remove sulphur, particularly from diesel. Now, I'm not trying to defend Glencore because they also work in oil and gas extraction, but credit where it's due. Glencore are giving miners who work for them long-term contracts. This is African miners, African people who work and live in Africa. They're getting long-term contracts, making sure employment arrangements are fair, safe and transparent unlike the oil industry. And here's a new twist in this story. Now, a man called Mark Dummett, who is the head of business security and human rights at Amnesty International, which is the organization that originally revealed the horrendous stories about children working in artisanal mines. This is what he said very recently. Artisanal mining is a lifeline for millions of impoverished people in the DRC. Now, that is a bit of a twist. It's hard for us to imagine the desperate poverty in countries like the DRC. It's very hard for us to judge what is good for sub-Saharan Africa. But from the Africans who spoke at this event, being able to participate by working in a safe, transparent, regulated industry that genuinely shares the enormous wealth created by that activity is a good starting point. The foundation of the FCA, the Fair Cobalt Alliance, which was created by Glencore, Tesla, Fairphone, Huayu Cobalt, Signify and others, is another really good sign. We need to remember that batteries contain other materials. This is really important. This is talked about at this conference. And we need to make sure that the extraction of these other vital minerals doesn't become equally problematic. Zambia has the second largest cobalt reserves in the world. They are starting to exploit this. South Africa produces 80% of the global supply of manganese. Zimbabwe has the world's fifth largest supply of lithium. When you hear this, it's hard not to think it makes so much more sense to build the gigafactories in Africa, where the raw materials are. Then you've only got to ship it up the road. The Congo should be one of the wealthiest places on earth. We are all complicit in the current terrible situation. If you're watching this, some of the materials in the device you're watching it on have very likely come from the DRC. And without question, much of it originates in Africa. It's the same for me. It's, I'm not accusing anyone. We're all the same. 
the equipment this is being recorded on has materials that have been dug up in Africa and we have to make sure that is fair. It doesn't mean any of it has been dug up by children, but remember this, a highly emotive issue like child slavery and mining can also act as a discreet cloak to stop us looking at larger corporate negative behaviour happening right next door or right under our noses. But we also need to be aware of the externalities, as they're so politely called. We've lived with an energy system with massive, catastrophic externalities for the last 150 years. We need to stop that and move on. Now, that's all I've got. I could sit here all day and waffle on, but that's all I've got. So here's some lovely Patreons who support Fully Charged for $10 a month or more and are the absolute critical reason why we're still doing this and why I'm still sitting here waffling at my age. David Bowen, Adam Toms, Roy Good, Ian Watkins, Simon Everett, Calais Blixt Hagholm, Charlie Rear, Kevin Pereira, Bernard McGee, Mike Relliford, Andy Stroud, Ewan Gelly, Pete Wise, Joseph W. Pedrosa, Janus Bo Landry, Frank William Bickley, Elliot Richard, <laughs> thank you Elliot, Thomas Wedgwood, Craig Butler, Nick Pont, and Peter Helverstein. I'm hoping I said your, right, your name right, Peter. <laughs> couldn't even couldn't even speak after doing that that's all that is all not going to say anything about subscribing or anything else that's it thank you for watching as you already have been if you have been